Thank you, Dave. Uh, we're ready to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you'll go there with me. And I, I want you to understand that this chapter has to, a lot to do. Actually, the whole book of Corinthians, <laughs> the whole, honestly, the whole book of 1 Corinthians has a lot to do with shaking you and me up, of telling us what God knows is true, but what maybe we don't want to hear. Sound familiar? <laughs> it is kind of how the Holy Spirit functions. And so in 1 Corinthians 6, he begins to talk to us about grievances, how we aggravate each other, not you and your people outside the church, but people inside the church. I know it's hard to believe that people inside the church actually do grieve each other because you know we're all such a loving, kind, sweet, charming, good-looking bunch of folks, aren't we? That's our image of ourselves. God may have a little different image, but nonetheless, we can sort of be pistols, can't we? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so he says there's a problem with offenses, grievances. And the Corinthian church had even gotten to the place where it was a whole lot more than that. If you weren't careful, if you sat in their, their chair, they just might take you to court about this whole thing. There were lawsuits involved. I know it's hard to believe. But we live in a very, very much a lawsuit-oriented, a contentious kind of society these days. And so in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul begins to say, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous? In other words, before the court system who <clears throat> knows nothing about the claims of Christ on their life. Before the unrighteous, instead of the saints, meaning the Christians, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Some of those trivial cases. <laughs> Some of those trivial cases through the years that I think about. Of people coming to me and saying, would you, would you make Michael quit uh, singing right behind me because he's monotone? Or would you please tell Linda to quit, th quit singing because she's too loud and I, I can't hear what, what's going on with the guitar because Linda's too loud. And I, and I think, what do you want me to do, shoot her? Um, that would solve the whole problem right there, you know. Uh, grievances can be tiny like that, misplaced, by the way. I, I, had, I had one contractor who helped with, with this church. Um, and was a great help before I ever got here. Um, but he, he left the church, and, uh, and uh, I was told that by the elders who were here when I first came many years ago. And he lived nearby, so I went to see him. I went to see all those folks who used to be here and, and, and no longer were by the time I got here. I'm, I'm glad to tell you it wasn't because of me. Um, they left before I got here. And uh, I'm sure if they'd been here when I got here, they'd have all stayed. Uh, he kind of lied. Anyway, so I sat down with him, and I said, uh, I, I'm glad that you were part of the church family, but you left them, and I just wonder, is there something that you need to say about this? That, can, we, can we correct something? Is there something else that may have offended you? And he said, well, huh, I've got a problem with the color of the carpet. The pastor at that time wanted blue carpet, and I wanted a red carpet, and, we, and every church ought to have red carpet. That's how it is. Uh, I said, you know, it's good to meet you. <laughs> and I got up quickly <laughs> and said, and God bless your household. And I, I noticed the carpet in his house was not red. Uh, so we, we, couldn't, we couldn't bring him back into the fellowship. I, I guess I didn't really want to bring him back into the fellowship, to be honest with you. I figure if you're going to flip a coin on what you're offended at today, that might, I might not ever keep you happy. And by the way, I've told you this before, I am not good at keeping people happy. I know it's a terrible sin, but it's just honesty. I just, I just am not good at this. And um, I, I, sometimes I'll say something or, or not do something I should do or whatever it is, and people will get, and I understand that. Um, and so Paul is saying, 
don't you know that we are to judge angels? I'm in, I'm in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. You know what he's saying here? If you can't get along in the church, what do you think that says to people who are outside the church? I've been in churches where I didn't want to go back again because people were not very nice. Not to each other, not to me. And so he was saying, it's a shame. It's a defeat. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Wow. Wow. If a Christian does you wrong, he is saying, try your best to forgive that. Move on. Love him anyway. And you may be saying, yeah, well, that's not my nature. And boy, don't we all know that, folks? We weren't planning on pleasing your nature. We were kind of hoping you'd grow into Christ's nature. We were kind of hoping the Holy Spirit would take charge over you and me. So that even if you do something wrong, you get sorry for it real fast and you apologize or you ask for forgiveness or at least you go to somebody. I've been around the state of Georgia for a long time, but I'm telling you what, folks. Everybody in Georgia gets trained to never tell you up front what's wrong. They just kind of talk behind your back. I hope I'm being personal here. You, you remember I told you I was good at offending people. Because we can talk about you. By the way, I'm from Missouri, and we do the same thing. <laughs> and whatever state you're from, I'll bet they do the same thing. It's human nature, isn't it? A friend of mine who was raised in the state of Georgia said, you know, it's because we lost the Civil War. <laughs> I said, oh, <laughs> so that's what it is. <laughs> Doggone that Robert E. Lee, <laughs> he lost the battle. <laughs> well... It's not easy to be straightforward and loving all at the same time. But it's important. Why not rather even suffer wrong? Imagine that. And so he says, Do you not know, I'm in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous, meaning the people who haven't come to Christ, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the spiritually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, not swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> uh, probably he may have included you in this list. Um, I'm not pointing out where I am in this list, but it, it may be possible that I'm in this list somewhere not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Not by our nature. Not by what we've been doing with our lives. That doesn't bring you into the kingdom of God. No, it doesn't. Incidentally, I don't mean to make too much of this, but uh, the, the English translation that I use, which is the English Standard Version, simply says men who practice homosexuality, which, which may seem harsh, but actually is pretty easy compared to what Paul wrote in the original source. He uses two words. Um, malakoi, meaning to be effeminate, meaning a man who acts like a woman. It is the female inference of homosexuality or lesbianism. And the other word is uh, our senokotai, which has to do with uh, being the man side of the homosexual relationship. In other words, both ends. Um, uh, probably everybody here has friends who are homosexual. I, I have family members who are homosexual. That doesn't mean I hate them, and, that, and you shouldn't either, by the way, because that is not how you're put together in Christ. 
those are people, and many of them, by the way, are very loving folks who are very concerned about you hating them behind their back. They are. And um, just like anybody else, you've had good experiences and you've had bad experiences. <laughs> and so have they. <laughs> and a lot of them are with Christians who hate them because they are uh, by nature something other than what they want them to be. So let me tell you, it's not up to you to hate these people. Try moving people into the kingdom of God by hating them. I'll tell you, that's a dead-end road. And so parents who get advised to make sure that by discipline's sake, they never invite them to Thanksgiving meal or never have them over, you know, cut them off entirely. I'm saying, wow, wow. Is that what Jesus would do, you think? Honestly, good night, alive. But I'm just simply saying what Paul is saying, listen, this is very strict. If you prefer your own sexual nature rather than Christ, you're not going to get into the kingdom of God. And you could say the same thing about alcoholics, couldn't you? Or drug addicts or thieves. Or, and, and, you know, if you're online very much, you understand how there are more thieves in the world than there are honest people, it would seem right now. Maybe that's wrong, but it just seems that true, is true to me. But any of those people are paddling along in their own canoe simply because they're without the living God in their life. This isn't talking about you who have come to Christ and then, and then you simply back off into sin here and there or you fall off the edge once in a while and you have to get up and dust yourself off and say, Lord, I'm sorry, and you repent of your sins and you get back in, in what needs to be done. No, no, that's unfortunately our human nature and I know we're fallen because it happens to every person in the face of the earth, even the ones who think they're holy. <laughs> You gotta be careful tagging yourself with "I'm a holy man," you know, because God will make you prove it if you're not careful. <laughs> and so, what I'm saying is that Paul is saying these people don't inherit the kingdom of God. Why is he talking about this? Is he condemning them? That is not his problem. That is not what he's trying to do. <laughs> what he's trying to say is, listen, you are in a world who needs Christ. <laughs> you are in a world who, by their own devices, will die in a terrible death. What you need to be doing is sharing Christ. You need to be sharing the love of Christ. You need to be sharing the fellowship with Christ. You need to be inviting these same people to church. I had a couple who came to me one day and said, because um, we were talking together sometime or other, maybe on a Wednesday night, about uh, someone had a friend who was whatever he was, uh, homosexual or, or not, whatever he was, and, and they said, and I'm going to invite him to church um, and I, I want to make sure that's okay with you. And I said, why wouldn't it be okay with me? Whoever you know out there <laughs> that you think needs the Lord, why don't you invite them on over? And he did. And so this couple came to me after a few weeks and said, listen, um, we understood that in a conversation here in the church, you said you wanted, you wanted homosexuals and gays to come to church. Uh, I, and I said, well, I'm sorry you had to hear this from somebody else. We'd like to hear my lips say it. Well, we're going to leave the church because we don't agree with that. And I said, and you think I do? <laughs> you, you, pardon me. <laughs> you, you, you really think I do too? Uh, see, see, you got this all wrong. Are they wrong? I think they are. I think, you understand, I've given my life up to an understanding Center that I am, that the scriptures are true. That Paul wrote what he's writing, not because he hated them, but because he's operating by the Spirit of God and saying what needs to be said. Listen, guys, whatever your intentions are in your life, the truth is the truth is the truth. And no matter how you deny it, how you back away from it, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That is the premise of God. That's his promise. All you got to do is listen to it. All you got to do is hear it. <laughs> and so that couple did exactly what they promised they would do. They, they did leave the church uh, because we were welcoming uh, gay people. You win some and you lose some. And so 
Paul is say, saying, not condemning these people, he's just really stating the awful truth. Go on your own way, do whatever your nature tells you to do, and you will end up in sorrow. So he's telling the Christians, listen, you have to, you have to, you have to be at a place where you're no longer bringing lawsuits against each other. <laughs> uh, go with me, uh, hang on to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, go with me to Matthew's Gospel chapter 18. Um, in which Jesus talks about offenses, what to do if there's an offense, if somebody uh, says the wrong thing, does the wrong thing, offends you in some way. And, of course, some of the worst offenses is, I understand that, is lifestyle. Um, living in a way that offends you, I understand all that. Um, I... Uh, um, I, I, have, I have some folks who uh, were very upset because Ruby and I uh, replaced an old chain link fence with a new chain link fence uh, in our backyard. And, um, and the insurance gave us the funds to do that, so we replaced the one with the other. And I thought it looked pretty grand myself. You know, we went from kind of rusty black to, uh, to shiny metal, you know, but it offended them. And, uh, and so, uh, as, as was already there, I put a gate uh, between them and, and us so that we could go through that gate to each other's house if we, need, if we wanted to. And, um, and um, he said, I'm, I'm never going to come through that gate. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, wasted money on that. Uh, wh why, why that? Uh, well, because we were going to put up a wood fence. I thought you were going to help us put up a wood fence. And I said, I, uh, um, hmm. Um, he told me what, my, my fence contractor told me what a wood fence was going to cost, and I didn't have $20,000. So, um, but I guess he did. So they put up a six-foot tall wood fence, and, and it went all across the back, and and he made sure there was not a gate <laughs> in his fence. So there's my little chain link fence and there's six inches and then there's a six foot wood fence staring at us. And uh, well, you know what they say, uh, good fences make good neighbors. And, 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 and he proved it, right? <laughs> he proved it. <laughs> we never have to talk to him again. <laughs> it's a terrible calamity, I know, but uh, I, what can you say? Well, there's an offense factor here that Jesus gives us in Matthew 18. If you're offended, do not put up a six-foot wood fence. But there is something you can do about if people rub you wrong. Look, look at Matthew 18 and verse 15. If your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's the first step. You still with me here so far? First step is have a talk with him. Hey, you know, what you said offended me or um, what you did offended me or you, uh, you sat in my seat in church, it offended me. Yeah, I know some of these things we, don't, we will not put out there on the table in plain English because even we know it's stupid. <laughs> Even we know it's been small. <laughs> but okay, okay. So now, now, here's the first step. Have a talk with him. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Great. But if he does not listen, oh, here's the problem. Take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Kind of, now we're in sort of the, the Christian court proceedings, you know, where there has to be some witnesses, Right? And um, so, okay, so you bring along somebody and say, listen, we had this conversation before, and, and you said, I don't care, and I just think you ought to care. <laughs> so I brought George and Joe along with me, <laughs> you know, uh, to help me uh, convince you that you should care. And if he also says to them, I don't care, um, verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. I'm getting offended here. Somebody a lot bigger step into this. 
There we go. Oh, now, now you offended him. Uh, <laughs> Parker and I will have a talk after the service. <laughs> All right, moving on. First step is have a talk with them. Second step is bring some other friends along who can understand the situation and have a talk with them. And if none of that works, tell it to the church. Um, I'm the pastor of the church, and I guess you could say in one way, I'm the church. So sometimes people come to me and say, this is the problem, and I understand that. And that means that both they and I and this person will have to have a sit down. They will have to have a talk. Well, if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, meaning let him be as if he were not part of the church family. And the reason is because he doesn't listen to the church family. He doesn't want to be a part of how to operate in a church family because this is how you do it. You don't sit on your grudges. You don't sit on your angers. And you don't throw rocks behind their back. You, you get it out front. And um, if none of that works, then you know the fellowship is broken down between you. Terrible day. Sure enough, that's what a six-foot wood fence will do for you. So Jesus goes on to say, keep, listening, keep reading down with me. I'm in verse 18 of Matthew 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. And the, and the, the original source actually says, has already been loosed, has already been bound. Heaven's already knowing ahead of time what you're coming with. It's already been done, but you've got to agree with it, you see. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered in my name. What's, what's going on? Where two or three are gathered in my name, what's happening? I am among them. What are you seeking? Listen to me. What are you seeking in times of difficulty and trying to get, deal with offenses? You are seeking the presence of the Lord. And that sure beats going to court and suing somebody because they're not nice to you. And so, I'm seeking the presence of the Lord. And that's what the fellowship of God's people is all about, honestly. You came to church this morning because you wanted to seek the presence of the Lord. You wanted to enhance what you already know is true. That His love and His care is in your life and what he asked of us when we understand that his love and care is to come together with others and praise his name because of that be an assembly be a church <laughs> gather together praise the Lord sing his praises pray together unburden yourself with others who love you let Christ be lifted up in your household because you know friends the longer you stay in your household, the longer you deal with life, the more depressing it can become, the more disturbing and distressing it can become. Afflictions come, not because you're evil, but because it's life in the world. And you struggle with it every day. And so because of that, he is saying, you need a lot of help. That's what the fellowship is for. I have always known how powerful it was for the teaching of the Word of God in my life. Uh, but there is something I have been impressed with through the years just as well, just as much. And that is how important the fellowship of God's people is together. Not so you can argue about the color of the carpet or, or be offended, but that you can come together with an understanding that we are in a fellowship together because Christ is in our lives. And the presence of Christ is important, so vastly important in order to keep you at a place in your thinking where life is worth living, where you can do your job every day, where you can feed your family, where you can pay the bills, where you can deal with life on an even keel and keep your perspective. Because if you don't keep your perspective, that's why people who even know Christ in their lives, unfortunately, every day, they dropped out of the fellowship somehow. Somehow, it was no longer important for them 
to have Christ's presence in the middle of all that they do and say. I, I, I take you back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where um, Paul says, I'm, I, I just read you this, this terrible list of all those folks who are not going to heaven when they die. <laughs> Yet they're not in the kingdom of God. But, but, um, take a look with me in verse 11. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. Y'all there? Where he's talking about none of these are going to inherit the kingdom of God. And verse 11, such were some of you. But, it's an important word, however, in other words, you were washed, you were sanctified, meaning set apart to God. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning forgiven your sins, and by the Spirit of our, Lord, of our God. Yeah. Some of us have been terrible people. Some of us have been awful in our choices. Some of us have known the Lord and walked away with great arrogance. And then finally, 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 when life was no longer fun, turned around and came back. We're, we've been guilty of all kinds of stuff. But such were some of you. But Christ has washed you. He has sanctified you. He's justified you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In other words... All that, amazingly, amazingly, all that, God has washed away. God's forgiven it. And the Corinthians had a lot to be forgiven for. They were a contentious little bunch. That's why they're going to lawsuits with each other. I remember a, a, a contracting job. My father was a contractor, and I was attempting to be a contractor <laughs> with him. <laughs> And uh, for, for some years, and, um, and, and a man had, had asked us to, would we please put in a curb on his, at his house um, and, um, and, a, and a walkway. And uh, so we were piling what needed to come out of that place so we could put in the concrete uh, on the side of the road, out of the way of traffic, of course, um, with barricade. And, uh, and along came a fellow who lived above him on, up, up the road. And he drove by, and he stopped his car, and he, and he got out, and he said, um, uh, I want this all removed. Uh, nobody asked whether uh, I was in favor of him doing this or not. And this is just the way he operates. And so I'm just going to tell you now that if you don't remove this and stop this operation, I'm going to sue all of you, including him. And you just tell him that. And... Um, my father had known this man all of his life. And my father was a very, honestly, he was a very good guy. Um, but he looked at him and he said, Troy, you don't want to do that. I'm not part of your lawsuit with this neighbor. But if you sue me, I'm going to sue you right back for harassment. And I, and I, may have been for the first time in his life this old man looked at him and his mouth dropped open <laughs> he hadn't expected a contractor to fight back <laughs> and um so he uh he said well you just you just tell him that i want next time next time floyd i i want him i need i'm gonna have to give permission for him to do anything on his own property now you know and uh <laughs> we said sure <laughs> Uh, once you know, once you fall into that hole, it's hard to dig your way back out. By the way, there was never a lawsuit made on that. We got the job finished and went our way. Thank God. Uh, life is just full of trouble at times. And so Paul says, all things, verse 12, here's what the Corinthians had said to him. When he was saying, listen, you're going to have to watch your lifestyle, what they said back to him was this phrase, all things are lawful for me. See, I'm, I'm not Jewish. The law doesn't apply to me. But Paul says, but all things are, but not all things are helpful. And again, they say, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. In other words, there may not be a law against you smoking cigarettes. 
Um, and yet, you will pay the price. Amen. Anybody been a smoker for 50 years in here and had them figured that out? <laughs> My father died of lung cancer. Seven years after he quit smoking. But from the time that he was a little guy, smoked camels, unfiltered cigarettes all of his life. And if he couldn't, if he couldn't find those or afford those, he'd, he'd uh, roll his own with Bull Durham. I, I remember as a child uh, in my home, a uh, uh, little guy, uh, it, it was my job to empty dad's ashtrays. Uh, every so often I would uh, fall down on the job <laughs> and I got told uh, by my mother, you know, you know, you're supposed to, okay. And, um, but in my household there was blue smoke. Every time I turned around, my dad was smoking inside. People, lots of people smoked, lots of people, men and women, boys and girls. Uh, first thing I ever stole was a pack of cigarettes as a kid because I wanted to smoke them. Couldn't afford it, so I stole them. And uh, yeah, you, one of those things you look back on and say, what were you thinking? Nonetheless, nonetheless, all things are lawful. But some of them are going to turn around and bite you. So he says, I will not be enslaved by anything. You may say food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both, one or the other. The body, I want to mention this to you in this passage, in these nine verses from 12 through the end of the chapter, verse 20, in these nine verses, the body, in the Greek, soma, is mentioned eight times, eight times. Obviously, what he's trying to tell us is, listen, what you're doing in the body is going to matter for eternity. So he says, in, uh, in, as you go into... Uh, verse 13 the body is not meant for sexual immorality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body what in the world are you talking about Paul the body is meant for the Lord yeah because if you look quickly with me at verse uh, uh, 19 do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God you're not your own you're bought with a price so glorify God in your body the body's meant for the Lord? Yes, in this way, to serve the Lord. To do what he's asking you to do with your body. And so he, say, he says, the body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord. In verse 14, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, make them members of a prostitute? Never. You understand, Aphrodite was a, a, one of the major goddesses of Corinth, and they served the goddess by attending to the female and the male prostitutes that were in the temple. Part of the worship was Aphrodite, part of the worship was sexual immorality. That was a means of worship. Can you believe it? But it's true. And so he says, don't you know putting yourself in that place with that person don't you know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So he says one more time in verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. How do you get around? Sexual lust. Run. <laughs> run. <laughs> it's hard to run when you're into pornography. Admittedly, you have to turn on the computer or your phone. There's lots of ways for it to reach you, isn't it? You know, get in there. It's not easy to, to quit some things. Um, I, I, I think in terms of, um, I'll, I'll describe somebody to you from the 4th century. You may be wondering what he has to do with your life. Well, let me explain that to you. Augustine of Hippo. Hippo was a major city at that time in North Africa, part of the Roman Empire. And... Um, Rome had not yet fallen, although it was on its way, uh, as when he was a young man. And he lived his life in uh, North Africa, 
uh, in the Roman Empire and was a very, very intelligent teacher. Uh, he also was full of a young man's lust and he lived with a woman for a number of years. They had a son. And at age 31, Augustine came to Christ, surprisingly enough. He had rejected all of this message for quite some time. In that day, North Africa was not Muslim because there were no Muslims. <laughs> Um, and it was a very Christian kind of, of uh, kingdom. And so the, the kingdom of Numidia in uh, North Africa. And so he had rejected all of this because his mother was a committed Christian and he couldn't stand the whole message of Christ. He just kept running away because of his lifestyle. And finally, when he was age 31, he came to Christ. And after a little period of time, he, he decided that living with this woman was not going to work. No, she was not a Christian and she wasn't going to go. But he decided he would be a major part of his, his son's life and his son did become a practicing Christian under his dad's uh, time of fellowship with him. You may be saying, well, so what are you telling us this story for? Because Augustine going down the roadway uh, found a a lady whom he had been living with and walked out on at, because of his Christian commitment. And she, uh, she yelled for him, Augustine. Um, and he turned around to see who that was and realized who she was. And she said, and he, he decided to start walking the other way. <laughs> Just walk away. And she kept yelling for him, Augustine. Now, there was a whole crowd in the, around him, you know, and, and all of them, of course, now were looking at him, you know. Like, what, and uh, she said, it's, it's me. Don't you understand, Augustine? It's me. And he turned around finally and said to her, yes, but I'm not me. And ran away. <laughs> Silliness, you might say. Oh, it was what was working for him, folks. The point of this story is, given a little time, Augustine became a bishop of the church. And therefore, he's known in history as Augustine of Hippo, the city of Hippo, where he served as the bishop for the church in his day and time. Rome fell. The Visigoths finally sacked Rome in 410 A.D. And, and in response to that, Augustine wrote a book called The City of God. All of their worlds were falling apart. The Roman Empire was no more. The soldiers who had maintained peace, the roadways that they maintained through the empire, all of them were going to pot. So he wrote the city of God to say to people who were believers in him, in Christ, Rome is not God's place. It was just a, a, a place in time. It is the city that God establishes that will be lasting forever. Put your faith where it belongs, not in the empire. Put your faith in the Lord who has brought you to Christ. He'll bring you through. So Paul says, listen, what you choose to do with your body, it will encourage you or it will kill you, but your, the choice is all yours. And so flee from sexual immorality. Every, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. If you had to ask me what's the theme of the whole of 1 Corinthians, it would be this verse. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Nothing's easy, in my estimation, about living the Christian life. It might look easy to you if you watch other older Christians because, well, they've been through a lot of battles. And they've understood what, how, to, how to run from some things. But it's never been easy, not for them, any more than it is for you. No, 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 no. You have to stand up and be somebody. 
that your body says, I don't want to be. That your mind is not comfortable with at times, but you have to stand up anyway and say, I'm going to serve Christ. I want to go in his direction. This is what makes life worth living. Let's pray together. We're grateful, Father, for the price that you did pay. Christ on the cross. That's the price that bought us. Shedding his blood. Redeeming us from our own sins. Not his sins. Our sins. By taking them on himself. The price that he paid. Sometimes we might forget that. In the crush of life. That you have paid it all for us. And so we are not our own. We've been purchased. We belong to somebody. Far more precious than we are. But we belong to him as his people. May that be true of us in how we're living our lives. How we're thinking. What we're doing with our lives. With our bodies. May Jesus Christ be praised May we be forgiven our sins. That's kind of important, don't you think, folks? May we be forgiven our sins, our actions, our lust, our desires, our hatreds, our angers, our fears. May we be forgiven. In Christ's name, so that, Lord, we become more and more fully the people who belong to you. In Christ, we're praying together. Amen.